Okay, uh, thanks you all uh, for being here for going the World Cup. Um, okay, so this is about computing solutions in infinite horizon discounted adversarial patrolling games. Uh, the backdrop for this is really about game theoretic modeling of security. So uh, obviously security has been in a lot of people's minds the last, uh, certainly the last decade uh, or so. Uh, the reason game theory is relevant in security domains uh, is really twofold, or the primary reasons are twofold. The first one is that game theory allows you to account for the fact that the security resources are fundamentally limited. You can't patrol everything or you can't cover everything. Otherwise, it would be, the solutions would be trivial. And the other crucial point is that we assume that the adversaries are intelligent. They're somehow responding to the defenses. And moreover, in the models that we're going to utilize, we assume that the adversary model monitors what defenses there are, right? So, uh, and exploits if there are any patterns uh, that are exploitable or they're predictable. Okay, so here are some examples uh, via visual or uh, via pictures. One is here the LAX airport. Uh, there's been actual fairly well-known deployment of game theoretic security uh, patrolling strategies on LAX airport. Um, other examples would be something like uh, Mumbai city uh, pat uh, policing, where you're trying to prevent terror attacks. Of course, there's a famous or infamous terror attack in Mumbai a few years ago. And you can apply these kinds of techniques even in something like uh, wildlife preservation. There have been a few, uh, a series of um, uh, attempts to do that as well recently. Uh, so uh, the way we model security, uh, this, is, this talk really is about physical security. Okay, the way we model it is by use of what are called Steckelbert games. So Steckelbert games are leader follower games, two players. Uh, the Steckelbert leader here is going to be the security forces. So you see your, let's say, LAX patrols, you commit to some strategy, okay? So the strategy in our world is going to be some randomized policy of patrolling the different targets or potential targets. Uh, what we're gonna look for are Steckelberg uh, equilibria, uh, which are basically these optimal randomized defenses, optimal, uh, optimal randomized patrols that in themselves account for attacks that observe the defense policy. All right, so hence the Steckelberg. So the game goes as follows, right? You first commit, the defender first commits to some randomized policy of patrols. The attacker observes or knows, somehow finds out this randomized policy, patrolling policy, and then responds to it by attacking some target. Okay, so you might, you know, you might ask, how is it that the attacker knows the randomized patrolling policy? And we're gonna posit that the attacker has significant time to do some surveillance, which is pretty standard for attackers to do. Uh, for example, they, they'll spend a fair bit of time trying to record or document where the defensive resources are and uh, make their inferences and respond to it. And so we're kind of taking the limit of that process. Uh, now, there are some limitations of at least the traditional approaches to security games. Typically, they did not account for something like constraints between successive patrol moves, okay? So where do the constraints arise from? I mean, the constraints are basically, I'm at target one, right? And there might be a constraint that prevents me from going to target two. One of those constraints would be terrain, right? So if the, if the other target is across the river and there's no bridge and I have a car, right, they can't really get there except they have to go through some, uh, some circular route. Okay, there might be sensitive areas that I cannot go through directly to get there. You know, for example, in the airport, there might be, uh, you know, bathrooms that I cannot really uh, go into. Okay, and so forth. Uh, moreover, different routes that I can take may have different costs, right? So an example would be I can drive through mud, which is gonna be very costly, time consuming, or I can drive on the freeway and that's gonna be relatively cheap, relatively fast, okay? Uh, moreover, in many settings, um, the attacker can observe the current location of the defensive resource. The defenses are sort of very, very visible. An example of that would be Coast Guard board patrols, right, where the boats are fairly clear that they're Coast Guard boats. Another example is typically police patrols. You can see where the patrol cars are. Okay. Uh, so we're going to address these limitations by creating a model and then trying to, uh, to uh, come up with solutions techniques for this model. The model is called adversarial patrolling games, right, and it's basically uh, in nature what it sounds, right, we have patrolling games that account for somehow intelligent attacker response. So a bulk of the talk is going to be about computing solutions to these things, as we'll see that's going to be a very, very hard thing to do. Um, and uh, then I'll close with some experiments. Okay, so what are adversarial patrolling games? First of all, there are two player games. In our world, there's gonna be a defender and an attacker. So the defender patrols, just like in regular security games, some set of targets, I'm gonna label them one through T. Okay, and the defender uses, can use up to our resources. So what are the resources? They would be patrolling, so for example, individuals or cars or Coast Guard boats that they could deploy at different targets. Okay, 
So now we're going to impose a graph, G over targets, which represents our constraints, or the converse of constraints, right? So basically an edge from target I to target J is going to mean that I can go from target I to target J. If there is no edge from I to J, I cannot, take, I cannot make that move. Okay, so those, that's how we're going to represent the constraints. As is typical, we're going to use uh, the adjacency matrix A to basically encode this graph of constraints. Okay, so moreover, even if there are feasible moves, they may still incur some costs, and those costs might differ for different feasible moves. So we're going to assume that the feasible moves, we're going to denote the cost uh, for moves between I and J as CIJ. Okay, so now the defender is going to commit to some policy pi. This policy pi uh, in our world right now could be a really, really complicated thing. So in general, pi is some mapping from you know, possible sequences of patrol moves before now, okay, plus time, right, it could depend on time, it doesn't have to be stationary, to the probability distribution over targets to patrol next, okay? So this allows us to randomize. Now, what about the attacker? The attacker is going to observe where the defender is at any point in time, right? So I can see that I'm the attacker, I can see the defender, the Coast Guard boat is over there right now, okay? So additionally, we assume that the attacker knows this policy pi, okay? And uh, one example of how the attacker would come by this information is, again, the attacker would exploit some extensive surveillance information that they can gather or crowdsource, if you will. Okay. So the attacker at any point in time is going to observe the patrol boat, let's say, or the, uh, the security resources, and then is going to decide whether he waits, meaning waits one more step, so it's going to be a discrete time game, okay, or attacks now and then. If the attacker chooses to attack, he's going to attack some target. So there's also the choice of which target to attack at that point in time. Okay. Now, suppose that the attacker has attacked, so they've moved to this target they're about to attack. The attacks are not instantaneous. They may take some time, you know, whether the attacker puts, you know, deploys some bomb or, you know, gathers together some information to finish the attack, whatever, right? So we're going to assume that in our sort of discrete time world, attacks take H steps, right? So H could be one, which means that they're basically instantaneous or it could be any arbitrary number here. Okay. Now, some targets are going to be more important than others to the defender and the attacker. For example, an LAX domain, LAX airport domain, right, the different terminals uh, service different numbers of people. So the different consequences for attacking different targets. All are important, but some are more important than others, both to the attacker and to the defender. And they may be differentially important, meaning that the attacker may have different values over the different targets from the defender. We're going to account for that as well. Uh, finally, the game is going to be discounted, right? It's a, uh, there's, there's some time component to it. And both the attacker and the defender care about time. Okay, so we're going to incorporate this concern with time by using the discount factors. Now, they may care about time differently, so there might be two different discount factors. One for the defender, right, that's gamma D. One for the attacker, that's gamma A. Okay. So just to make this a little bit more visual, just so that uh, we are on the same page, here is a map of the New York Bay. Okay, here is some arbitrarily chosen target. One of them is New York International Airport. Okay, and well, let's assume that we have one patrolling resource, which is a Coast Guard boat. Okay, so this induces at least sort of a caricature of this graph, which represents essentially that I can take a boat, so I have a waterway path between one target and the other. That's what the edge is. If there's no edge, you can see that basically there's a land you have to go around. Okay. And of course, the uh, labels next to the targets are going to denote some relative valuations of those targets. Okay. So our goal, just like in traditional security games, is going to be to compute the stack equilibrium. Okay, and the semantics are very similar, of course. It's a much more complicated beast than our setting. Okay, so specifically, so for every defender policy, there's some optimal attacker response, right? So fix pi, right? The attacker will somehow optimally respond to that. I'm gonna call that best response. Okay, so the goal now for the defender is to compute the optimal defender policy that accounts for how the attacker is going to best respond to that. Right, and that's important because whatever the utilities are are going to depend on both the defender's choices as well as the attacker's. Right, so I need to account proactively for what the attacker is going to do in response. And we're gonna allow the defender's policies to be stochastic or you know, they can randomly move between the targets depending you know, at different times. Okay, so uh, this is sort of, at least for those of you who are familiar with stochastic games, this, kind, uh, this is kind of reminiscent of stochastic, uh, of stochastic games. And one thing that's known about stochastic games is that there are always some, there's at least some Markov stationary equilibrium, okay? Uh, which is great, that's really helpful, 
And the question is, um, is this true in APGs? Now, despite the fact that APGs or adversarial patrolling games, I'm going to use short APGs for it, despite the fact that APGs look like stochastic games, they're not. Okay? So they are actually different game theoretically because, precisely because they're a leader follower. Right? So the leader commits to the entire policy of actions. The follower knows this policy, and then they respond to it. And then, if you will, the resulting stochastics and the, you know, the utilities play out. So it's actually semantically different from stochastic games. Okay, and the question is, you know, does nevertheless, do you still, can you still restrict attention to microstationary policies for the defender? That would help a lot, uh, but unfortunately you can't. So we can show that Markov stationary policies can be arbitrarily suboptimal in this case. Okay, and in fact, it could be arbitrarily non-stationary to be optimal. Okay, so the fact that there, you know, you have to basically keep around in the worst case, you have to keep around arbitrarily long histories is kind of unfortunate. So the best we can hope for is somehow approximate this using finite length histories. Okay, so intuition would be, of course, that you know, if you have keep around sufficient history, uh, at least in practice, uh, that should be good enough. Okay, so that's what we're going to basically focus on: is finding solutions for fixed histories um, of some fixed length could be arbitrary. Okay, we're going to start with a mixed integer nonlinear programming formulation to solve this problem. That's not necessarily very encouraging because most people realize, you know, who do mathematical programming, mixed integer nonlinear problems that are non-convex, especially which this one will be, right? They're next to impossible to solve. Okay, but uh, good news is that we can subsequently translate it to some other approximation that's going to be much more tractable. This is really the key step, as it turns out. Okay, so. The formulation is going to be for a defense policy that uses only the previous k moves. And remember, the moves here, I'm, going to, I'm calling something moves. Really, defense moves are configurations of defense resources over targets here. Right? So it's actually not so, so a simple thing either, okay? just something to keep in mind. Okay, so there's going to be a little bit of formal notation for me to explain what, uh, what follows. Okay, so hope you can stay with me. Okay, so S. Uh, is basically your sequence of recorded moves that you're going to condition your policies on. Okay, so Z sub, super K here is going to be one particular coverage vector, right? And I'm going to keep around K of this, the last K that I've seen. Okay, this is both, uh, both for both players. Okay. So I'm going to call this sort of casually state. You know it's not exactly the same thing, but uh, it's going to be just uh, for short, I'm going to call this state. Okay, this capital S is the set of all feasible things of that kind, right? All feasible K length sequences. Capital B is kind of a translation of this adjacency matrix of the graph into, um, in, into what we really need to keep around. So B as Z is going to be 1 if and only if z is, this, is going to be a valid transition given the state s, right? given the sequence of moves s. And it turns out it's easier to compute this given the HSC matrix, and I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to keep, uh, keep this other matrix, if you will, that's going to be q. It's going to be, it's going to be useful uh, uh, notational, as you'll see. And uh, it's q s z s prime. Basically, um, it's 1 if and only if um, uh, s followed by z results in state s prime. Right? So basically, it's just an indicator that allows me to encode the fact that I'm appending another move. Okay, pi is going to be defensive policy, and that's of course a variable. Okay, so uh, pi is a real valued variable. Okay, we're going to encode the attacker's decision using binary variables, and I'm going to call those b and a. b is going to encode the decision of whether to wait or to attack, and variables a are going to encode decisions about which targets to attack. Okay, so this quantity P, capital P of S, uh, sorry for the confusing notation, this is really going to compute the expected total cost incurred by the defender, um, okay, after S. And little c, z, z prime is the cheapest way to go between two coverage vectors. Okay, so there are really sort of three main challenges or uh, challenge, um, hurdles to overcome to construct this mixed integer nonlinear program. The first one is, uh, you know, how do we compute expected utilities? And I'm going to focus on the attacker utilities. Uh, defender is completely symmetric. Okay, so in order to do that, the first step is we're going to compute this quantity. It's uh, alpha z s z t. Okay, it's the probability of making a move z, okay, exactly t time steps after state s, okay, without passing through it earlier. So, uh, and that's of course going to be a function of the policy pi. Okay, so to, it, it, of course, you know, when t is 1, this is just a policy pi, 
right? For arbitrary t, you can compute this recursively using the, uh, the equation here. And you don't have to necessarily digest this. Just know conceptually that this, is, this could be done. So why do we need this thing? So now we can use this to compute the probability of reaching the coverage vector z starting from state s in at most h steps. Okay, and the reason this is useful is because, of course, now this tells us, essentially gives us a way to compute probabilities that the attacker is going to be caught or not, right, when they they attack some target. Okay, now notice that these constraints already encode these bilinear terms. Okay, that they're not convex. Okay, I'll come back to that. Okay, so now we can compute the utilities for both the attacker and defender, right? So we can partition it into the utility if the attacker is not, if the target that attacked is not covered, and the part that's the utility that if the target is attacked is covered, right? And these alphas now allow us to compute the corresponding probabilities of these things happening. Okay. Uh, next step is, you know, how do we compute expected costs? It's a little bit easier. Okay, so again, we're going to split this up into two pieces. Okay, so first, let's consider computing expected costs, supposing the attackers just attacked some target J in state S. Okay, so now we know that we have exactly H steps to go before the game ends, and we uh, get some utilities. Okay, so what we want to compute is the costs with T, some arbitrary T less than or equal to H, time steps before the game ends. Okay, when t is equal to 1, this is pretty straightforward. For an arbitrary t, again, we can compute this recursively, right? You can part uh, partition this into two pieces. Again, you can have, you can, if one piece is the cost, if the defender passes through j right away, meaning the next step. And the other piece is going to be the cost if the defender does not pass uh, through j right away, which is going to be the recursive part. Okay, and again, we have the bilinear terms here. Okay, so... Uh, the next piece is, uh, you know, the cost if the attacker if the attacker waits, and again you can compute this recursively. So I'm running low on time, so I'll move forward. Okay, so the final hard piece, in some sense, is computing the attacker's best response, which we can actually do or encode in a set of constraints. And basically, these constraints allow us because b's are binary variables, m here is some arbitrarily large constant or sufficiently large constant. This allows us to ensure that uh, one of these constraints is going, the right hand side is going to be tight, which means that the value uh, VA, which is the value, the expected utility of the attacker, is going to be exactly the, uh, uh, the, right, the right thing, okay? Exactly, in this case, the cost of waiting or, or not waiting, and the utility of waiting or not waiting. Okay, so um, I hope you can understand this full mixed integer nonlinear, no, really not, uh, but I just wanted to flash it for you anyway. Uh, it turns out in the special case when there's zero sum, we can formulate this as actually a much simpler problem, uh, program. And you can see details on the paper for that. Okay, so I've mentioned that mixed integer nonlinear formulation is crazy hard but, uh, to solve, but it's a means to an end. Turns out that once we add the next step, which is uh, discretization, we can actually approximate the whole thing using mixed integer linear program. And this step turns out to be not so difficult. Okay, so the, the key point is we discretize probabilities. Once we do that, we can represent policies as effectively choosing a discretization level, meaning we have binary variables. Once we introduce these binary variables into the bilinear constraints, okay, we can linearize all of those using fairly standard McCormick inequalities. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details. You can see the paper, but uh, a lot of this is fairly boilerplate. Okay, so let me go through uh, some experimental evidence of, uh, of the fact that this works. Okay, so the attacker gets their award between zero and one from attacking a target in these experiments. These are all simulations, uh, which we generate them um, uh, uniformly on zero one interval. We tried a few different networks. Okay, so uh, the first comparison we draw in terms of utility is to some previous work on adversarial patrolling games. Uh, it's a somewhat different setting. The most salient difference, and actually the most consequential one, is the fact that they do not consider discounting, which we view as a fairly important uh, point. It turns out that uh, the discounted versus undiscounted variants require completely different solution techniques, or at least our solution techniques uh, have to be quite different. You cannot extend what they propose to our case. Uh, but what we did was kind of, we compared our solution to theirs uh, on fair turf, meaning that we set the discount factor equals to one. Obviously, we can make ours m uh, look much better uh, if we have a discount factor that's less than one. But in fact, we actually outperformed them even when the discount factor is one. Okay. Now, uh, an actual question is we're do doing this uh, uh, mixed integer linear programming via discretization. And the question is how much discretization granularity do you really need to get good solutions? And it turns out not a whole lot, okay? So essentially we can get away with 10 discrete probability values uh, in most cases, and it doesn't seem to be all that sensitive to networks. 
Um, of course, we uh, clean up in terms of running time. The mixed integer and nonlinear programs are really hard to solve. Mixed integer linear programs scale much better. Although, if you have zero sum game, it turns out we can do even better than that. And the final real uh, piece, experimental piece is that uh, another question you may ask is uh, what happens if, you know, how, how much does k, how many steps do you need to keep around, essentially, and how well do you do? And it turns out that you can do without keeping around a whole lot of history, and you can do reasonably well, at least in some cases. Uh, so I'm just going to leave the conclusion up there since I'm out of time and take questions. Okay. So it's a very, uh, very cool work, but um, I'm wondering, so it, it seems that the optimizing for expectation uh, in scenarios like terrorist attacks isn't quite perhaps the right thing to do because, I mean, terrorists only really get one shot at the terrorist attack, right? And expectation tells you what happens if you repeat the policy many, many times. Um, so I was wondering, does this, if you try to optimize for something like, say, weighted difference between expectation, expected utility and the variance of the, of the, of the utility, would this theory somehow still hold? I mean, would, would many modifications be necessary to adapt it? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so, uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think this will be such an easy extension. Um, however, I think that, uh, so what will be an easy extension is to incorporate risk aversion. Okay, because that's just a transformation of the utility function. And I think that's good enough because if you can just impose a risk averse utility on the adversary, and if you think the adversary is very risk averse, uh, I think it's actually even more, more natural to do that. And this will translate directly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're running a little bit behind, so we'll move on. Thanks again. Our last speaker. Um.